Good evening and most welcome to Heidegger 865. Now it's getting tough. We're getting into the real book. It's not an easy task, I promise you. Uh, to be able to read this, I more and more understand all what I've done before was necessary. It's a requirement. This would never be a university book at a general course. It's way too beyond. But it asks different, most important question. Rudolf Gershet is himself a professor in comparative literature. And therefore, few questions here are very important for him. And this is also the name for this lecture. The possibility of reflection and analysis. This is most important. And those are things that I think there is a general agreement has been given up just because of self-reflection and self-identity. And the problem is the following. Is it possible to be part of this course, system, self, unity, department, subject, or even the ego? and still be able to reflect. I would say today, most people will say, no, that is going to be subjective. That's going to be a take that's inside the system. And on top of that, doesn't properly reflect anything. And that is a major problem. And uh, within science, that was the idea until 110 years ago that we could not ever reflect outside the system. It was an impossibility. And this is one of the things the Tain of the Mirror takes up in the most clear way. And of course, this is paving the way to be able to do deconstruction yourself, to be able to understand the text better and at the same time being able to reflect upon it, to make an analysis. And not like most people say today, uh, let me cite uh, Bergstrand at the University of Washington. Nobody seriously believes anymore that reflection or analysis is possible. Everything is subjective uh, points of view. Uh, Rudolf Gachet is the only one who doesn't agree with Bergstrand, and it's a very peculiar view he has. And of course, it takes a lot of effort to explain this view, but he has to go all the way back until you get to the pre-ontological state, before the limits of reality were set. Because once the ontological limits are set, no other conclusion is possible. None. Proven by science, proven by mathematics, proven by logic, and widely accepted as well. This is the death of the human mind. You can understand what a book it is. And the praise on the back of the cover, uh, it does have its due. These are very clever people who understand what he has opened up for, a completely new way of seeing these things and making it possible to make an analysis and be proud of it. And it's working as well. One of these things that been treated before, uh, amongst other, is Paul Ricoeur. He used to be a uh, well, a fling on mine for a couple of months. I think it was one summer in the late 90s. He's fantastic with his language. And here is a site that ex exequently, uh, excellently tells the story uh, from his book, The Rule of Metaphor, uh, page 50 in the book. Speculative discourse is possible. 
because language possesses the reflective capacity to place itself at a distance. That's the important thing. And to consider itself. Do you see what he's saying? This is this self-reflection. Look at oneself and making a statement or doing an observation. Something that is unlawful in normal discourse. As such and in its entirety as related to the totality of what is. Language designates itself and its other. Its other. This reflective character extends what linguistics call metalinguistic functioning, but articulates it in another discourse, speculative discourse. It's no longer a function that can be opposed to other functions, in particular to the referential function, for it is a knowledge that accompanies the referential function itself. The knowledge of its being related to being. So he widens the idea and he doesn't make you with only being referential. Of course we can be referential and at most of the times in academic circle the only thing we can do is to refer, be referential. He says there is a possibility for something much wider. That is to look at something, making it an observation and still be part of it. Nothing short of being amazing. From a Hegelian perspective, uh, Rudolf Gachea continues on the same page, Ricoeur's definition of speculation could easily be considered Kantian. One reason for this is that Ricoeur understands the speculative discourse itself as a discourse about language, discernible and multiple functions, as a discourse that thematizes and extends the metalinguistics function that accompanies the function of reference. So he says it's okay to have reference, referential language and a metalinguistic function that is on top observing at the very same time. According to Ricoeur, each of these functions can be clearly and absolutely distinguished from each other. So not only can we have the both, they can also be distinguished, which is very important. So that's quite a gain from only being able to be referential and not even know if that referential nature is either subjective or has something to do with one's own interest. Maybe because you have an economic view of some sort, nobody knows. I'll skip a couple of lines here and here we have another very telling line in the second paragraph of page 51. In order to be all-encompassing, the speculative discourse cannot be about the functions of language. If the speculative discourse is restricted to the articulations of these functions, it remains in Hegelian terms opposed to language. Therefore, Hegelian speculative knowledge demonstrates the identity of self-cognition and the cognition of the world of objects. The identity of these two positions occur at the moment when exterior reflection or the reflection of objects recognizes that it must presuppose itself as self-reflection and that the immediate object of its reflection is merely the reflection of that which grounds exterior reflection. I think this needs some explanation.
as I said before, this needs to be approached in different ways to, to be made understandable. Uh, Rudolf Gershé has at least 15 to 20 different approaches. And that is important because the thing in itself cannot be directly described. But I talked earlier about closed systems. And they are self-sufficient. I call that SS, like the, the dream of mathematics by Hilbert and later Gödel, that everything that regulates mathematics is within mathematics. Why is it so? Well, because self-reflection and being outside and looking at oneself is an, was, I would say, an impossibility before. Uh, it was shown this to be self-sufficient was the thing that was impossible. And uh, as I said earlier this afternoon in the lovely garden, that was an immense surprise. It was not something predicted. Nobody on this world would have predicted what Gödel found out. No one. No one ever. And if he hadn't found it out, it's not certain that anyone would have found it out. But we learn for the very first time that self-reflection actually is necessary. It's also possible because otherwise there wouldn't be a mathematical system. There would be nothing to decide meaning, order, sequence to the mathematics. And this is actually similar to the Klein bottle where subject and object in one way is the very same thing and then they are completely different and they cannot be reduced to one thing and neither can they said, be said to be only two different things they are one and they are also two 100% one and 100% two reminds me a bit by, uh, uh, about the trinity I think that's a good example actually the Trinity looks like this, God, the Son, the Holy Spirit, however you shorten that, they are all 100%, but at the same time being one and the same thing. And I think this is very funny, I mentioned that a couple of years ago for Kalle, there was a hymn in the Anglican Church, all in one and three in one. And it was enough to sing it without any intention to ridicule the Anglican Church or any church. Because everybody knew that that was impossible. And that was not something that was taught, that was something we experienced from reality. So now you might understand why this is so important. We need to go into what is before conception, what is before ideas otherwise we would be stuck to the same conclusion because it's the same world this self-reflection does not imply idealism neither does it imply materialism neither is it a middle way in between the two it actually rejects the two as being uh, non-working Let me jump a bit into the book. Bravely, I jump into the book. No, I am at page 104. And we start talking about otherness. Probably it's by, by Levina, don't you think? Levinas. Levinas. <laughs> the otherness of unconditional heterology is the undecidable reserve of negativity. Speaking of the pharmacon as one other name for this otherness, Derrida remarks, contradictions and pairs of opposites are lifted from the bottom of this diacritical differing deferring reserve. Already inhabited by difference, this reserve, even though it precedes before the opposition between different effects, even though it pre-exists differences as effects 
does not have the punctual simplicity of a coincidencia oppositorum. It is from this fund that Dialectus draws his philosophemes. The pharmacon, without being anything in itself, always exceed them in constituting the bottomless fund. The fund he's talking about is the bottom, what everything is lying on. This is this pre-existing thing. Pre-existing does actually not mean existing before, because existing is not possible pre-existing, of course, but it's before existing. And what is before existing? Uh, this is the use of the mirror. I mentioned it before. The mirror can be seen this way and somebody looking at it. At it. Earlier this afternoon I had one of the approaches, one of the 1520, and in this approach we said perfection is the thing looking into the mirror and the thing coming back, reflected back on the chain of the mirror, the aluminium foil or tin foil, the thing that is behind the mirror. Let's see here. If I look into the mirrors now, there is a little tin foil behind the glass that reflects the camera. And the reflection I see when I look into the mirror is not situated on the mirror, it's sort of halfway. And that is quite mysterious. That is very unusual. No objects has this feature. And this is one of the reasons the mirror is so different from anything else. We are also the uh, only animals that understand the mirror. No other animal understand mirrors. They can see themselves and a monkey, for instance, if you put a dot on his head, he will touch the dot when he looks into the mirror but he doesn't understand the mirror. That's a whole different thing. This started with this very, very odd thing that a mirror is. We have no other similar thing in nature. And that is very important to understand. It started out in reality. Nothing of thinking, ideas, ideology, not even, as we say in Swedish, a Lidnesh knapp could have caused this or created this. A Lidnesh knapp this is quite interesting in itself. It was this uh, doctorand up in Uppsala and he got a piece of wood in his head and after that he became a genius. It's really weird. So still to this day uh, we call a sudden outburst of geniality for a Lidnesh knapp Knap is the knack on the head door, something like that. This is definitely a book that is the equivalent of a Lidnish Knap. It's absolutely unique in literature. The other Nas, I continue on page 104 after the quote of Derrida. Uh, the other Nas, which is referential to other more alien modes of difference, conflictuality, contradictions, modes of difference that cannot be made meaningful by bringing them to a stop in negativity, is not merely of the order of what Flach calls the heterogeneity of the principles. It is an otherness that divides the principle against itself that is more originary than it, that even divides a double principle. Like that of Flach, the minimum of the absolute relation. For the radical alter alterity that Derrida thematizes, and that we call radical only for reasons of convenience, there is no place either as an essential moment of the principle or as that which pr these principles shape or constitute. Or in the totality of what Flack calls 
the one thinking we are down to our very thinking is it possible to think about yourself well until recently the majority of for instance neurologists would say no that's impossible the reason being this gestalt being in the bottom once you're starting to make conclusions from your own reality being completely objective putting no bias in it you will always come to the closed system theory it is of nature the mirror is of nature uh, the chain of the mirror doesn't show it does not show it isn't of nature what is trying to show the mirror can have different takes not only one and having more than one it's not acceptable that's the demise of this dogma of the gestalt as i called it before once there are more than one possible reality or experience it won't work in order for the logosetris to work it's primary and singular gospel is i am the only one there is no other ways for me rodolphe gachet showed beyond doubt that there are actually other ways of being and then all of a sudden you know self-reflection is something possible you can monitor your own thoughts you can even watch your own ideology see who you are in contrast to other people but only by itself you can make a judgment that is something that is deemed impossible and that is one of the reason for instance in many research subject qualitative uh, research is deemed lesser the reason being the subject enters somewhere it's a subjective uh, determination it's a subjective observance whereas a quantitative is so much better because the idea is all the subjective things sticking up that they get shaven off and you end up with something that is generalization in this way that is more objective and that makes for really terrible knowledge what is not getting any easier here Well, found it's also connected to uh, grounding. Uh, where do you ground your reason? In this self-sufficient or self-supportive uh, system, there is no grounding. There's no outside to be grounded on. The ground is within somehow, hmm. because there can be no otherness in this idea. Otherness is made impossible. let us address specifically i start in page 142 second paragraph let us address specifically the three general concepts that i have put in quotation marks in this definition of deconstruction the first one is accounting for second is grounding as i called found before as it differs from metaphysical operation of grounding and the third is structure. All the time since Plato, all reasonable speech has been held to be that which not only asserts, but also always accounts for what is asserted. By stating the grounds or reason for it. Yet such a substantiation by reasons or grounds of what is asserted and hence the claims to knowledge of reasonable speech 
does not proceed exclusively by empirical and logomathematical justification, it must also take place, as Kant writes at the beginning of Critique of Pure Reason, in a free, free and public examination. As logon didonai, what does it mean, Kalle? Uh, to give the word or give speech or uh, speak as logon didonai, uh, to give the speech, uh, uh, to deliver speech. Thank you. Thank you. All rendering of accounts, all accounting, that is, all stating of the grounds of what is asserted, compromises a practical and public aspect in which the thinker justifies himself before others. Just in ancient Greece, the individual laid his entire life bare in the public square of the Agora to reveal, uh, receive the civic stamp of approval of the whole community, without which his life as a citizen would have been incomplete. So to the appeal to public approval is a necessary and intrinsic element of philosophical accounting, without which for so philosophy could not claim universality. In this process, the individual self-consciousness coalesces and the legiti legitimacy of the grounds of explanation receives its official stamp of recognition from the public. The concept of accounting for then which ultimately hinges on the logon didonai involves much more than merely stating grounds in the process of substantiating what is asserted. Here we have the main problem when it comes to grounding. Where do you put your ground? In this self-sufficient uh, system, you don't have a ground. What's inside all the arguments, all the axioms, the propositions, are thought of being self-supportive or supporting each other in thin air, hanging above. And that <laughs> makes really bad arguments. I think mean, that is one of the reasons the, uh, the, the general debate of today is really uh, hit rock bottom. Because we try to find justification within the system. We try to be what we usually perceive as being objective. But being objective in this situation is not objectivity. It's not taking care of the general opinion of thinking. It's not partaking in uh, the society as such and in the radical otherness. That, I think that's the right word. The radical otherness that makes analysis and reflection not only possible but also qualitatively qualitatively good. Uh, the matter of quality is important and without realizing this uh, the quality won't be good. It doesn't matter what you do or if you try to be radical or go against the grain of what is today this uh, homogeneous mixture of nothingness and where you don't have proper opinions anymore. Uh, everything has to be uh, put into a general mold. Like science, for instance. We mentioned that earlier with purple review. That makes everything look the same. It has to be approved in an automatic manner. And it's the actual mechanical movement that lowers the quality. And this lowering of quality has been noticed. And that's the reason why it's gone down as it has. I will return to the downfall of thinking later. Uh, this is uh, the good stuff, this is the solution. Uh, but it helps actually to understand how we got here as well. Uh, this historical uh, turns is something that always interested me because sometimes it, make, it makes it much clearer. I will end with the last site and um, 
this is my favorite part uh, of this lecture, and that's the pre-ontological and pre-logical status of infrastructure. There is a pre, both to ontology and logic. And I would say, as I saw pre-logic before, that was that you first have to establish an order. Where is that order coming from? How can you tell what to choose first? And that's, of course, part of the problem of mathematics, for instance. Because you need a law that says you should put two after one and three after two. But such a law cannot be formulated within mathematics. The same goes for logic. If you have two propositions and make a syllogism, you need another law that tells you you have to put it in that way. And that law cannot be within the system. So the human being, so to speak, always comes in. But he doesn't have to be a human being as such. But at least this way you can understand what some people call the dehumanization of knowledge. It's not a correct word now when I understand the whole circumstance. It's not so much about taking human beings out of uh, uh, the knowledge circle and saying something that is non-human is better. That is not what has happened. What has happened is uh, we got stuck in this pre-arranged model. Pre-ontological and pre-logical. And listen to this. Uh, this is from coming from him specifically. I understood for the first time why the law of the excluded method was sort of baked in from the beginning. That was not something that Aristotle, for some mad reason, just said should be there. Heck no, he didn't even get any good argument why it should be. It was actually baked in in the idea of the mirror. Because with a mirror, you get the idea it can only be one. <laughs> one last time, let's take a look into the mirror. The idea you get is either the mirror reflection, the mirror image, or what is looking into the mirror. And the law of the excluded middle, not only Aristotle made this conclusion, most thinkers, I would say even all, said, it has to be either or. Some said it for the imagery, the thing that came back. Those were the idealists, possibly. The other one who said that the thing looking into the mir uh, mirror, those were the empiricists or materialists, because they claim the substance of the thing looking into the mirror. The things reflected is obviously not substance. So you can see how it starts. And therefore, not because of some jocular nature of the hand in, 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 the, in the eyes of Aristotle, this was needed because of the mirror. It has to be either or. Either or to make what Derrida called fund. But the fund turned out to be unstable. It to, turned out to be nothing because it's at the same time supposed to be contained within the system which doesn't work in the long run, which we know. This is what Derrida means when he deconstructs, and this is what Gachet writes about the matter. Because of the strategic predicament of the infrastructures, that is, because of the contextual and historical determination, it is, rigorously speaking, improper to refer to infrastructure as such, as I have, have done until now. Three of these infrastructures was uh, absolute reflection, philosophical reflection, and isolated reflection. And just to mention a few, the infrastructure as a specific complex organization responsible for the philosophical opposition of structure and genesis is only one possible infrastructure. 
one possible. There can be several. It is extremely important to realize. And that in the sense in which I use the term here. For reasons of exposition, however, I shall have to continue to speak of infrastructures in general. In order to name everything that can account for the differences that I will be addressing. Now, in establishing the preontological status of infrastructures in general, one encounters the same problem. Owing to the fact that the qualification preontically refers, rigorously speaking, to the character of one particular infrastructure with regard to the opposition in philosophy of beings and nothingness, presence and absence. And there you have it. This is the ground law. It's not a definition, but it is as close to definition you, come, you can come to without falling into the hole. This is where it starts, the battle between presence and absence, existence and at, uh, emptiness. This is the very moment where I understood why I, until then, always felt, perceived or even experienced that it has to be a choice. It's an either or. And the best I would have been able to arrange with would be the, would be the Quinean solution and actually fire oven solution. And that is one plus one. And I realize it can't be that way. It has to be the both completely separate and at the same time the same. Nothing allows for this. This is contra all logic in the world. It's contra everything I heard. And that's a good reason for it. It's the gesture, uh, the gestalt that is in the bottom. That's the infrastructure. The infrastructure is what I called gestalt previously. It hinders us to see that there is more possibilities. And that is one of the reasons uh, a visionary thing like this can be effective. This is even more effective because this one has three or four takes. What he describes has at least 15 to 20. Actually, there are an infinite of different infrastructures. That is scary. <laughs> I say thank you very much. It's been very interesting to have this very first take on the very book. It's a handful. It took me 200 hours maybe to get into the first third part. It's a tough thing. But my hope is to make it easier for you. I spent ages studying deconstruction, Derrida and so forth. Well, I spent two thirds of my life doing it. And now I'll be able to give something back to you. Thank you very much and I wish you a very pleasant evening. Bye-bye.